Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, thank you to all the organisers. Thank you to Peter and Jim and Rose. Um, obviously, it would be nice if we were able to meet in person in Waterloo this summer, but seeing as that is not going to be possible, uh, I think this series of talks is certainly the next best thing, and I'm really happy that they're happening. Okay, so the, the general topic for my talk is uh, logical languages, um, the expressive power of logical languages, what they can say and what they can't say about classes of mathematical objects, and in particular what they can and cannot say about classes of matroids. Um, I'll mention my co-authors. All the work that I'm going to be talking about is joint with various combinations of Daryl Funk, who's at Douglas College in Vancouver, Mike Newman, who's at the University of Ottawa, and Jeff Whittle, who is my colleague here in Wellington. Okay, so I'm going to be talking in particular about uh, monadic second-order logic. Monadic second-order logic, you should think of that not as being a logical language, but as being a family of logical languages, family that has certain things in common. And uh, if you want a version of monadic second-order logic for talking about matroids, then probably what you'll end up with is something like this. So you'll end up with ingredients that include a sec set of variables where those variables represent elements of the ground set. And then you'll have variables that represent subsets of the ground set. And you'll have binary predicates that allow you to talk about the relation between those variables. So you can talk about two variables being equal. You can talk about an element being contained in a subset you can talk about one subset being a subset of another. Because we're talking about matroids, we need some way of talking about matroid properties. So we do that with an independence predicate. So this is a unary predicate, and that means that we can think of it as a function. It takes as input one of the variables representing a subset, and it returns a truth value. So it returns a value of true if that subset is independent in the matroid. Uh, next up, cardinality. We can't really talk about cardinality of subsets, but what we can do is talk about things like whether a subset has even cardinality or odd cardinality. And more generally, we have these modular cardinality predicates. These are unary predicates, and for every pair of integers p and q, we have a predicate that says this subset has cardinality p mod q. So in particular, we can talk about sets having cardinality 0 mod 2 or 1 mod 2. We can talk about sets of even cardinality or odd cardinality. And then the rest of the language is constructed using very familiar logical ingredients. We have the standard logical connectives and or not implies equivalence. And we have the standard logical quantifiers. There are the existential quantifier and the universal quantifier. And the collection of formulas that we construct out of these ingredients, that is called counting monadic second order logic or CMSO. Uh, we also talk about a, a sub collection of formulas. So if I talk about MSO, that's monadic second order logic, and by MSO, I mean the formulas that we construct without using the modular cardinality predicate. So MSO is the collection of CMSO formulas that I construct without making any reference to the size of sets. So from time to time, I am going to distinguish between CMSO and MSO. Okay, so it takes a little bit of practice to get familiar with this language uh, and to start getting a feeling for what you can say in this language. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll put up an example of a sentence in this language and I'll just give you some time to, to think about what this sentence is actually saying about matroids. So take a look at that and see if you can translate it into something that humans can understand. Uh, if you feel like unmuting yourself with your idea about what the sentence is saying, then go ahead, go for it. Um, otherwise, I'll walk you through it in a, just a minute. 
Anybody want to um, volunteer anything about this sentence? It's like every independent, every dependent set contains a circuit. Uh, very close, James. Um, for every set E1, if E1 is dependent, then there exists a subset of E1, call that subset E1, such that, sorry, um, call that subset E2, such that E2 is independent. So, so far I've said every dependent set contains an independent set, E2. And then what's this bottom part, what's this bottom line saying about E2? Anybody uh, got a handle on that? It's a maximal independent set. It's a maximal independent set. Yeah, this bottom line is saying that E2 is maximally independent. Uh, so if E2 is contained in E3, then and E3 is independent, then E2 and E3 are equal. That's just a way of saying that E2 is maximally independent. So if you wanted to translate this into human language, it would say something like, whenever E1 is a dependent set, then it contains a set E2 such that E2 is a basis. Okay, so that's what it says about matroids, and I'm sure lots of people will be able to tell me what class of matroids I'm now describing. Feel free to unmute yourself. Uniform. There we go. So this sentence is describing the class of uniform matroids. That property holds in a class of matroids if and only if it's the class of uniform matroids. Okay, so what we have just seen is that there is a sentence in MSO which describes the class of uniform matroids, that defines the class of uniform matroids. So that leads us quite nicely to our first, uh, our principal definition. So consider a class of matroids, let curly M be a class of matroids. Then curly M is definable in the language CMSO or MSO if there is a sentence in that language that is satisfied by exactly the matroids in curly M. So it is satisfied by a matroid if and only if that matroid belongs to the family curly M. So what we have just seen on that previous example is that the family of uniform matroids is MSO definable. We wrote down an MSO sentence that defined a class of uniform matroids. Okay, so there's an obvious question. What are the classes of matroids that are definable in CMSO or MSO? So here's an important observation made with reference to matroids by Petter Lenny. So Petter observed that any minor closed class of matroids with finitely many excluded minors is MSO definable. So for example, we now know that the class of F representable matroids is MSO definable as long as F is a finite field. And we know that because Rota's conjecture is being proved by Gielen, Harrods and Whittle, so that that class of F representable matroids has finitely many excluded minors and is therefore MSO definable. This, this observation of, of Petters, it also goes through for graphs. So if you think about the monadic second order logic of graphs, then the same property holds. So what that means is that any minor closed class of graphs is MSO definable or definable in the monadic second order logic of, of graphs. Uh, in the world of matroids, though, of course, things are, are more interesting. That, that question is more nuanced because we have classes of matroids with infinitely many excluded minors. And a priori, we don't know that any such class will be MSO definable. So we could imagine that there are minor classes of matrix that are not MSO definable, and indeed that turns out to be the case. So that was the content of a couple of papers written by myself with Mike and Jeff. So we wrote our papers in response to an article written by Peter Vamos. Uh, the title of his article was The Missing Axiom of Matroid Theory is Lost Forever. And our follow-ups were entitled, Is the Missing Axiom of Matroid Theory Lost Forever? And Yes, the missing axiom of matroid theory is lost forever. And what we were commenting on with that last title is this theorem here, saying that the class of F representable matroids is not CMSO definable when F is an infinite field. So for fields, we have this kind of dichotomy. Uh, a class of the class of F representable matroids is 
CMSO definable if and only if F is a finite field. And we'll come back to that dichotomy a little bit later on. Okay, so I was talking about uh, this sort of material a little while ago in a seminar and somebody asked me a question afterwards that is actually worth, um, worth addressing in some length. So the question was this, if we like definable classes of matroids, if we think of definable classes of matroids as being good, as being better than non-definable classes, well then why not just use a stronger version of logic? Why not just consider full second order logic instead? That's the logic that allows you to quantify over families of sets instead of just sets. So why not do that? We would end up with many more definable classes of matroids and that presumably would be good because we like definable classes of matroids. Okay, so that's a fair question. So let's spend a bit of time uh, addressing it and thinking about why we are interested in monadic second order logic. Because we definitely could do that. We could use full second order logic instead, and we would indeed get many more definable classes of matroids. So the reason that we don't do that is because we wouldn't learn much more about those classes. All we would learn is what, what we already knew, that you can write down a sentence in second order logic that defines those classes, and that's where it would stop. You wouldn't learn much more. Uh, I actually, I wager that, you know, most natural classes of matroids could be defined in some version of full second order logic, but you wouldn't learn much more about those classes. Monadic second order logic actually teaches you something. And that's because monadic second order logic is kind of a bridge between the theory of computation and the, the structural theory of matroids or the structural theory of graphs. And I can justify that, that assertion by pointing to a few theorems. So let me do that. Um, there's a famous theorem by Corsell. Corsell's theorem tells us that if you have a monadic second order definable property for graphs, then you can test that property in polynomial time as long as you limit your input class to a class of graphs with bounded tree width. And this is interesting because monadic second order definable properties, in general, they are going to be NP hard to test for graphs. You can test Hamilton, uh, you can define Hamilton necessity in monadic second order, for example. So these properties are hard to test in general, but if you impose some constraint on the structural complexity by limiting a, a width parameter, then that intractable property becomes a tractable property. So there's a connection between structural complexity and the theory of computation, complexity theory. The matroidal version of this theorem is due to Petter Lenny, and Petter proved that if you have any CMSO definable property of matroids, that can be tested in polynomial time, as long as you limit the input to a class of F representable matroids with bounded branch width, where F must be a finite field. And Mike and Daryl and Jeff and I have been able to extend Lenny's theorem to some other natural classes of matroids. Uh, as another example of the connection between monadic second order logic and, and structural complexity, I would point to Cease's theorem. I, I won't take the time to go through Cease's theorem in any, any depth. If you don't know what decidability means, don't worry about it. That's not going to have any bearing on the rest of the talk. Uh, but Cease's theorem is a really beautiful theorem. I, I really, really find it incredibly attractive. It says that the monadic second order theory of a minor closed class of graphs is decidable if and only if that class of graphs has got bounded tree width. And it connects the theory of computation, decidability versus undecidability, to the structure of minor closed class of graphs because Robertson and Seymour essentially tell us that a minor closed class of graphs either looks like looks kind of tree-like, or it contains large grids. What CESA shows is that if you've got large grids, then you have an undecidable theorem, an, sorry, an undecidable theory, because large grids look kind of like Turing machines. I don't have time to go more into detail about it, but I think that's a really beautiful connection between Turing machines, tree automata, and structural theory. So anyway, there is some justification for monadic second order logic being a bridge between the theory of computation 
and structure theory. And in general, I think the point is that monadic second order logic does a good job of approximating the boundary between tame behavior and wild behavior. Um, obviously, I, I can't give a precise definition of what it means to have tame behavior or wild behavior, but I think we all have some kind of intuitive understanding of which classes of matroids are tame and which classes of matroids are wild. If I was going to use a weaker version of logic, such as first order logic, which does not let me quantify over sets, I would end up defining only tame classes of matroids. Whereas if I used a stronger version of logic, such as full second order, what I would do is end up defining a number of classes that exhibit very wild behavior. And monadic second order logic seems to sit in this kind of Goldilocks zone. Uh, it's in the sweet spot where the classes that are definable in monadic second order logic are typically quite well behaved, and the classes of logic, the classes of matroids that are not definable in monadic second order logic, are typically kind of wild and exhibit wild behavior. Uh, of course, that's a, a very general statement. I'm sure you can point to examples and argue against it, but I think as a general rule of thumb that that is a defensible statement. Monadic second order logic does go some way towards capturing the distinction between tame behavior and wild behavior. Okay, so now let's move on. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about gain graphic matroids. I won't assume any knowledge of gain graphic matroids. I'll spend a bit of time introducing them. So a way of thinking about gain graphic matroids is that gain graphic matroids are to groups as representable matroids are to fields. In some kind of a way, the elements in a gain graphic matroid are being given coordinates with elements from a group in the same, roughly the same kind of a way that the elements of a representable matroid are being given coordinates with numbers from a field. So the way we make that sensible is by using a graph and we label the edges of that graph with elements from a group. So if H is a group, then I'll say that an H gain graph is a graph where the edges have just been labeled with elements from that group. So in this example that I've put on the slide, I have labeled the edges of this graph with elements from the group consisting of fourth roots of unity. So I've got one, negative one, I, and negative I. Okay, so given that context, given an H gain graph, I'm now going to distinguish between two types of cycles. I'm going to distinguish between balanced cycles and unbalanced cycles. And balanced means that the product of the edge labels is equal to the identity. Okay, so if I look at that red cycle, I'll see that the product of the edge labels, well, I've got a one, I've got a couple of i's, that gives me a negative one, and I've got a couple of negative i's, that gives me another negative one. So I multiply them all together and I get one. I get the identity, so the red cycle is balanced. But if I go around the blue cycle, then I'll see that the product of the edge labels, well, a couple of ones, don't worry about them, a couple of i's, that gives me a negative one, and a negative i, so I end up with i. So that i is not the identity, the blue cycle is unbalanced. And, and at this point, you may have noticed that this definition is not well-founded if the group is not abelian, because I haven't defined the order in which I take the product. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about how we get over that. If your intuition is that we can take the product of edge labels in some sensible way, then you've got enough intuition. Uh, the, the way we get around the, the problem is by directing the graph and considering particular orientations of cycles, but that doesn't really matter too much. Just think of taking the product of edge labels and just take my word for it that we can make that idea sensible and well-founded. Okay, so this notion of balanced and unbalanced uh, gives us a matroid. So the ground set of this matroid is going to be the set of edges of an H gain graph. So I let omega be an H gain graph. My ground set is going to be the set of edges. So I need to define independence in that matroid. And I say that a set of edges is independent if when I look at the corresponding subgraph, it contains no balanced cycle and furthermore, any connected component of that subgraph 
contains at most one cycle. Okay, so no balanced cycle and at most one cycle per connected component. That is the definition of independence in these matroids. That is indeed a matroidal definition of independence. And any matroid that arises in this way, I'm going to say is gain graphic over H or H gain graphic. And you can think of gain graphic matroids as being roughly analogous to, to representable matroids. They play a, a role in structural matroid theory that is, is kind of similar to the role of representable matroids. So there are a few theorems I can point to to justify that assertion. You've got this theorem by Jeff Kahn and Joe Kung. Uh, what they did, you know, I can't talk about it in detail, but roughly what they did is they imposed a natural condition on minor closed classes of matroids and they showed that there are really only two ways to satisfy those conditions. You have to be the class of F representable matroids where F is a finite field, or you have to be the class of H gain graphic matroids where H is a, H is a finite group. Uh, you've also got a theorem by Jeff uh, in the late 80s talking about the critical exponent in gain graphic matroids. And you can also point to the structural theorems by Gielen, Herards, and Whittle in those theorems, in some of those theorems, gain graphic matroids play uh, an important role, in particular gain graphic matroids that arise from graphs that can be embedded on a surface of some kind of low genus. Okay, so there we go. I've uh, sort of given some points to justify the importance of gain graphic matroids, and I've, I've made a defense of monadic second order logic as being a, a sensible language, a natural language for us to think about with reference to matroid theory. So now we arrive at an obvious question. So for which groups is the class of H gain graphic matroids CMSO definable? So this is the question that, that Daryl and I started thinking about when I visited him in Vancouver uh, at the beginning of February. Uh, let's just recall the dichotomy for fields. So we have this theorem saying that the class of F representable matroids is CMSO definable if and only F is a finite field. Half of that theorem comes from Rota's conjecture and the other half comes from the missing axiom theorem. Okay, so given that theorem, there's an obvious conjecture to make, so let's make it. The class of H gain graphic matroids is CMSO definable if and only if H is a finite group. So I'll spend the rest of the talk um, discussing this conjecture. Okay, so let's, well, let's, um, let me make a reference to a, another conjecture. Uh, here's a conjecture, when H is a finite group, the class of H gain graphic matroids has only finitely many excluded minors. And if you recall Petter's uh, observation, Helene's observation, any minor closed class with a finite number of excluded minors is MSO definable. So if this conjecture holds, then it will immediately follow that the class of H gain graphic matroids is MSO definable when H is finite. But this conjecture may be hard to prove. So we could hope that it is easier to prove MSO definability directly, that it is easier to prove the weaker conjecture that the class of H gain graphic matroids is MSO definable when H is finite. I, um, I don't know what the attribution is for this conjecture. I haven't been able to find it written down anywhere. Um, I'm sure it goes back a, a, a ways. So if anybody wants to, to claim attribution for it or to, to assign attribution for it, I'll be interested to hear about that. And I will note that in this conjecture, you must have H being a finite group because when H is an infinite group, the class of H gain graphic matroids does have infinitely many excluded minors. In fact, it has infinitely many excluded minors of rank three. So that's contained in the theorem by Matt DeVos, Daryl Funk, Irene Pivotta. Okay, so this conjecture is what Daryl and I started thinking about in February. Uh, so I'll spend a bit of time um, talking about the ideas that we came up with, and I will start by talking about the positive direction. So this is the direction where we attempt to prove that a class of H gain graphic matroids is definable. So we start from H being a finite group, 
and we set ourselves the goal of proving that the class of H gain graphic matroids is MSO definable. Our first observation is that we only need to think about three connected H gain graphic matroids because if the class of three connected H gain graphic matroids is MSO definable, then the entire class of H gain graphic matroids is MSO definable. This is actually not completely trivial. Uh, to, to prove this fact, you need to think about the three connected components of the matroid. That's not the difficult part. The difficult part is discussing them using only monadic second order logic. So uh, proving that you can talk about the three connected components in monadic second order logic, you can discuss them, you can talk about their properties, and you can talk about how they're glued together. That is, that is non-trivial, but it is completed work. So let's just take it as read and move on. So from now on, I'm going to be talking only about three connected matrix. So our next step is to come up with a very complicated definition of when a co-circuit is good. Uh, this definition occupies about a page of writing. It wouldn't teach you anything if I put it up on the screen. You wouldn't learn anything from the definition. There are really only two things you need to know about this definition. The first is that it has to be a monadic definition. It has to be a definition that you can express in monadic second order logic. Uh, and the second is that it has this property. So if I go to a three connected gain graphic matroid, and I look at a good co-circuit in that matroid, then that co-circuit must be a vertex star, by which I mean uh, a set of edges incident with a vertex. Okay, so if you are a good co-circuit in a three connected gain graphic matroid, then you are a vertex star. Right, that's our starting point. So now let's think about how we could go about proving definability in a perfect world, so in a world where a certain simplifying assumption is true. So I'm going to make the simplifying assumption that every vertex star is a good co-circuit. So on the previous slide, I said every good co-circuit is a vertex star. Now I'm making the simplifying assumption that the converse holds. Every vertex star is a good co-circuit. Okay, so in this perfect world, we, we are away. Because now, in this perfect world, I have an underlying graph. So what I'll do is I will ask in monadic second order logic whether every element of the ground set is in at most two good co-circuits. If that's not true, then I'll just stop. I know that the matroid is not gain graphic. So I assume every element is in at most two good co-circuits, and now there is an underlying graph. The edges of that graph are the elements of the ground set and the matroid, and the vertices of that graph are the good co-circuits of the matroid. Or I guess more, more precisely, the, the vertex stars of the graph are the good co-circuits of the matroid. That defines a graph. And in monadic second order logic, I can talk about properties of this graph. Uh, in particular, I can define when a set of edges is a cycle in the graph. In monadic second order logic, there is a way that I can say this set of edges is a cycle in the graph. So now this gets me closer to talking about gain graphic matroids because I can say for every independent set of the matroid, there is at most one cycle in each connected component of the corresponding subgraph. So if I can assert this in monadic second order logic, and now I am closer to having a, I'm closing, closer to having a uh, gain graphic matroid. I still need to be able to talk about the labeling of the graph. I still need to be able to talk about the labeling with elements from the group. So how do I do that? What I do is I partition the set of edges into blocks where every block of the partition corresponds to an element of the group. So in this picture that I've drawn here, I have partitioned the edges into blue, green, and red edges. And I think of the blue edges as being labeled with a particular element of the group, the green edges as being labeled with another element of the group, and the red edges with being labeled with a third element of the group. So in this example, I've got a group with three elements. And note that I am relying on the finiteness of the group at this point. 
if the group were infinite, then I would need to talk about partitions into arbitrarily many sets. And I'm not able to do that in a monadic sentence. I am not able to say there exists a partition into k parts where k is some number yet to be determined. When I talk about a partition, I have to partition into a fixed and finite number of sets. So I'm able to do this because I have a fixed and finite group. And now I can talk about when a cycle is balanced relative to this labeling. So I go through every cycle of the graph such that that cycle is dependent in the matroid. And I check that the product of its labels, of the edge labels in that cycle, is equal to the identity relative to the partition that I have just chosen in the previous step. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you, how do you talk about the product of the edges being equal to the identity? Well, you partition up the edges of the cycle and you use that partition to keep track of the, the partial products as you walk around the cycle. So that idea of using partial products to keep track of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the signs that I guess I, as I walk around the cycle, I, in my memory, that idea is something that Mike and Daryl and I developed when we were at the Eindhoven meeting a few years ago. Um, it's certainly not original to us. Uh, for example, it is in Tony Quinn's thesis. I don't know if Tony's here today, but if he is, uh, maybe he could tell us whether it appears anywhere earlier. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. In any case, it seems as though it is the natural idea. It seems as though it's the idea that you just arrive at if you want to keep track of product of edge labels across cycles or paths. Okay, so you put all that together and now you're finished. Now you've got a monadic sentence which characterizes the H gain graphic matroids, except that we are assuming that we're living in a perfect world. We made that simplifying assumption that every good co-circuit must be a vertex star. And that simplifying assumption just can't be true in general, because if that simplifying assumption were true, if every vertex star were a good co-circuit, then every gain graphic matroid would be uniquely represented by a gain graph. And that's not true. We know that these matroids could be represented by very different graphs. So that simplifying assumption cannot be true. That's the bad news. Uh, we have some good news though. If there is some absolute universal upper bound on the number of bad vertex stars, so that's the vertex stars that are not good co-circuits, if there's some absolute universal bound on the number of those bad vertex stars, then we're back on track. Because what I will do is I will use the existential quantifier to guess the bad vertex stars. So if there are at most n bad vertex stars, then I will just have n existential quantifiers. So I will say there exist n sets. And I've now guessed those sets. Through the power of the existential quantifier, I can always guess them correctly. And I'll add those guessed sets to the collection of good co-circuits, and then I proceed as I did before. So instead of saying every element must be in at most two good co-circuits, I'll say every element must be in at most two sets where those sets are either good co-circuits or they are one of the n sets that I guessed. So I've just patched up the bad vertex stars by using the existential quantifier to guess. Okay, and then we're back on track. Okay, so that is good news, but there's bad news. Uh, there is no such bound. There is no absolute universal bound on the number of bad vertex stars. Okay, so that's bad news, but then there's some good news. Because if the number of bad vertex stars gets very large, then it starts to force structure on the graph. So we can say, okay, well, maybe there is some arbitrarily large number of bad vertex stars, but now we can start to try and determine what structure that forces on the game graph. So if you go down that path and you end up with this kind of definition. So imagine that I've got an H game graph and the corresponding matroid is three connected. And I look at a vertex star in that game graph. It may be the case that in every game graphic representation of this matroid, that vertex star is another vertex star. 
And in that case, I'll say that the vertex is a committed vertex. Uh, not every vertex needs to be committed, of course. If you write down a representation of a game graphic matroid, you may find a vertex star that is not a vertex star in another representation. Uh, those edges are not concentrated at a single vertex. So not every vertex is committed. But what I'm saying is that if you have a huge number of uncommitted vertices, then you start to force structure. So you end up with a theorem like this. So there exists an integer n, and it has the property that if h is any group and omega is any h gain graph with a three connected corresponding matroid, and in this gain graph there are more than n uncommitted vertices, then the gain graph has to belong to one of four classes of gain graphs. And those four classes are illustrated by these pictures. I'm not going to say too much about these pictures. Uh, I won't explain them in detail. I will just say that each of those gray blobs is an arbitrarily large graph where every cycle is balanced. The vertices that I've distinguished with the little circles, those are uncommitted vertices. And you can see how you can make the number of uncommitted vertices as big as you want. So in the first three examples, you just make the, the circle larger and larger and larger, the number of uncommitted vertices is going to be as big as you want. So you can make a huge number of uncommitted vertices, it's just that you have to do it in, in these classes. Uh, there are a few things I need to say about this theorem. First of all, you'll note that it is work in progress. Um, there's a lot of case analysis required to prove this theorem. Not all of that case analysis is written down in detail. It is just possible that we will discover another class. I really don't think that is going to happen. I certainly hope it's not going to happen. But because not all the analysis is completed in detail, I should sort of issue that warning. Uh, I think the theorem is, is definitely morally true, and maybe it's even you know, true, true. Um, some other things I'll say about this theorem, the integer n, that's going to be explicit. Once we complete the analysis, we will have an actual specific number. I think it's going to be double digits, like medium to high double digits. If you wanted to, I'm sure you could work hard and get it down to low double digits, maybe even single digits. I don't know why you would bother. Um, another thing about this theorem is you'll notice that there's no mention of monadic second order logic in it. This is just a structural theorem. But I'm not sure we would have been led to this theorem if we hadn't been interested in monadic second order logic. Uh, so that, I, I like that fact about it. We, we were forced to deal with structure because we were interested in this particular logic. And that sort of reinforces to me that monadic second order logic sits in this kind of Goldilocks zone. If we were dealing with a weaker logic or a stronger logic, I'm not, it's not clear to me that we would have been led towards a structural theorem. And then the final thing I'll say about this theorem is that it, uh, it is based fundamentally upon a theorem by Rong Chen, Matt DeVos, Daryl Funk, Irena Pavotto. What they do in their theorem is they characterize the H game graphic matroids that are in fact graphic. So they show that if you've got an H game graph, and the corresponding matroid is actually graphic, then the game graph belongs to one of six classes. And those six classes form the basis of our case analysis. Our case analysis falls into six subcases corresponding to the outcomes, the six outcomes of their theorem. Okay, so in any case, you put all of this work together and what you end up with is this work in progress theorem. If H is a finite group, then the class of H gain graphic matroids is MSO definable. So that means that half of our obvious conjecture is now proved. So the if direction of the obvious conjecture is now, is now settled. If H is finite, then the class of H gain graphic matroids is CMSO definable. In fact, it's, it's MSO definable as well. Okay, so that's the positive direction. Now I'll move on to the negative direction. So how do you prove non-definability for a class of matroids? We have a tool. We have a tool that allows us to prove non-definability. 
we have exactly one tool that allows us to prove non-definability. I've kind of convinced myself that this is the only tool that will work to prove non-definability. Uh, fortunately, it has a nice analog in the monadic second order theory of strings, so I can explain it to you that way. So let's think about strings or words. So imagine that sigma is a finite alphabet of characters, then a string or a word is just a sequence of those characters. But it actually helps if I define a string to consist of a set of positions, one up to n, along with a function taking that set of positions into the alphabet. So the function is telling us which character from the alphabet is sitting in each position. And now we can talk about the monadic second order logic for, for strings. So as before, I have variables that represent positions and I have variables that represent sets of positions and I have binary predicates that allow me to talk about relations between those variables. I need to be able to talk about the string in some way. So I do that with a sequence of unary predicates, character position incidence predicates. So I have one of these predicates for each symbol in the alphabet. So I think of this unary predicate as taking a position variable as input and it will return a truth value. So if the character in that position is equal to sigma i, then this predicate will return the value of true. I also need to be able to talk about when one position comes immediately after another, and I do that with a successor predicate, which takes two position variables as input until it gives me a value of true if one comes immediately after the other. And then the rest of the logic is exactly as we have for monadic second order logic for matrix. So that's a monadic second order logic for strings. And the obvious question is, when is a class of strings definable in this, in this language? So that is the question that's answered by the myhill road theorem. So I imagine that I've got a language, by which I mean a set of strings. So curly L is a set of strings. I take two strings because I'm going to define a, a notion of equivalence for strings. So I let W1 and W2 be strings. I'm going to define when W1 and W2 are equivalent relative to curly L. So they are equivalent if, whenever I take an arbitrary, an arbitrary string Z and I add it to both W1 and W2 by appending it at the end, then the resulting strings are both in the language curly L or neither one is in the language curly L. Okay, so what that means is that if W1 and W2 are equivalent relative to L, then both W1 and W2 are in the language or neither one is in the language. And furthermore, that relation holds no matter which string I append onto the end of W1 and W2. Okay, so that is an equivalence relation. And it turns out to characterize definable classes of strings. So the myhill road theorem says that the language curly L is definable in the monadic second order logic of strings if and only if this relation has only finitely many equivalence classes. Okay, so our tool for proving non-definability is a matroidal version of this. So we can use this myhill road theorem to prove non-definability. So as an exercise, you might want to think about, say, a binary alphabet of zeros and ones, and think about the language consisting of palindromes, the language consisting of palindromic strings. As an exercise, you might want to convince yourself that there are infinitely many equivalence classes relative to that language. And so therefore that language cannot be defined in monadic second order logic. We're going to use the same idea in matroids. So in this next lemma, I'm going to talk about gluing matroids together. And I'm going to use a reasonable gluing operation. I, I won't say what reasonable means, um, but for example, direct sum is reasonable, two sum is reasonable. If you want to glue matroids together along a line, as long as that line has got some bounded number of points on it, then I'll say, fine, that's a reasonable gluing operation. So stuff like that. And now I let curly M be a class of matroids, and I'm going to define an equivalence relation on matroids relative to curly M. 
So I let M1 and M2 be, be matroids. I'll say that they are equivalent relative to this class if whenever I take an arbitrary matroid M and I glue it to M1 and M2 using this reasonable operation, then the resulting matroids are both in the class curly M or neither one is in the class curly M. That is an equivalence relation. And our lemma says that if the class curly M and CM is so definable, then there are only finitely many equivalence classes under this my Hilner road type relation. So note that this is uh, not quite the same as the my Hilner road theorem. That was a, a two-way theorem. It was an if and only if theorem. This is not an if and only if lemma. It's only got one direction. If the class is definable, then there are finitely many equivalence classes. I don't see any reason to believe that the converse will hold or a version of the converse will hold. But in any case, this is the direction that we need to prove non-definability because if we can exhibit infinitely many equivalence classes, then we know that the class is not definable. So that's what we did in the missing axiom theorem. So we started with an infinite field, because the field is infinite, you can find elements in the multiplicative group that have arbitrarily high order. And we use those elements of arbitrarily high order to define a sequence of matroids. In fact, we used game graphs. So they are game graphic matroids. I've drawn the first few matroids in this infinite sequence. And the proof consisted of showing that these matroids are pairwise inequivalent under the my Hilner road type relation relative to the class of F representable matroids and relative to a reasonable gluing operation. So we took an arbitrary pair of matroids from the infinite sequence and we showed that we could glue on a matroid in such a way that one of the resulting matroids is F representable and the other is not. So these matroids are pairwise and equivalent. Therefore, you have infinitely many equivalence classes. Therefore, the class of F representable matroids is not CMSO definable. Uh, so as a corollary, you probably will have noticed that we get something about game graphic matroids. So if H is an infinite group with elements of arbitrarily high order, then the class of H game graphic matroids is not CMSO definable. So we're starting to make progress on the negative direction of the obvious conjecture. So now we have a, a Venn diagram that looks like this. The universe of our, of our Venn diagram is the collection of infinite groups. Everything that I've shaded red, we now know that it has a non-definable class of matroids. But I still have uh, groups where I don't know that. Anything inside the white ellipse is not covered by this corollary. So inside the white ellipse, I've got groups where I do not have elements of arbitrarily high order. Such a group is said to have finite exponent. So you've got plenty of examples of groups with finite exponent. You've got these groups called Tarski monsters that are quite nice. Probably the simplest example is the group consisting of infinite binary strings. So that's the group where you have an infinite binary string and the group operations, you just add those strings together component by component using addition modulo two. So that is a group with finite exponent. So that last corollary doesn't cover it. So that's where the situation was uh, up until quite recently. Daryl and I took this problem out again and we spent a bit more time thinking about it. We came up with another infinite family of representatives. Uh, so again, we can prove non-definability. This time we are not using elements of arbitrarily high order we are instead using an infinite subgroup that is finitely generated. So we get this lemma. If H is a group and it contains a finitely generated subgroup of infinite cardinality, then I can construct that infinite sequence and deduce that the class of H gain graphic matroids is not CMSO definable. So we've augmented our Venn diagram. Now it looks like this. So my second ellipse, the ellipse on the right, that contains groups that do not have finitely generated subgroups of infinite cardinality. So any such group is said to be locally finite. In a locally finite group, every finitely generated subgroup is itself finite. 
Anything outside of the locally finite ellipse, that gives me a non-definable class. Anything outside the finite exponent ellipse, that gives me a non-definable class. But rather annoyingly, these two ellipses overlap. So there are groups that are covered by neither lemma, and in particular, the infinite binary strings is still in that intersection. So neither of these lemmas covers the, the group of infinite binary strings, and it turns out there's a good reason for that. Because, if H is the group consisting of infinite binary strings, then the class of H gain graphic matroids is CMSO definable. So that obvious conjecture that I made earlier on, that's just plain false. So this is probably the most surprising thing that we discovered on my, my visit to Vancouver. Uh, Daryl and I were both delighted by the fact that the obvious conjecture is false. Uh, seems to make the world much more interesting, knowing that this conjecture is, is not true. Uh, and it opens up some interesting questions. So, so how does that proof work? How do we prove that proposition? It turns out it's not too difficult once you know how to guess the graphical structure of the matroid. So if you go back to the first part of the, the talk, where I was talking about proving definability, I need to use the structure there. I need to be able to guess the graphical structure using the same sort of procedure that I talked about. And then once I have that, I can talk about balanced cycles and unbalanced cycles. Balanced cycle is dependent on the matroid and unbalanced cycle is independent on the matroid. And what I do is I make the relatively easy observation that a matroid is gainable over this group of infinite binary strings if and only if for every unbalanced cycle, there is a set of edges that meets that unbalanced cycle in an odd number of edges, but it meets any balanced cycle in an even number of edges. So it's kind of an orthogonality type argument. And you'll notice that here I am using the modular counting predicate, the modular cardinality predicate. I need to be able to talk about uh, sets of odd cardinality and sets of even cardinality. So I really am using all of CMSO. In the finite group case, I was able to do it in MSO, but here I need CMSO. Okay, so the obvious conjecture is false, but we can replace it with an obvious question. What are the infinite groups such that the class of H gain graphic matroids is CMSO definable. When H is an infinite group, when is it true that the class of H gain graphic matroids is CMSO definable? So our Venn diagram now looks like this. We've got the, the red non-definable region as before, but we also have a blue definable region. And in that definable region, I've got infinite products of finite groups. Uh, actually, it's, that's not completely unconstrained, I have infinite products of finitely many finite groups. So I take any finite collection of finite groups, I make as many copies as I like of those groups, and then I glue them all together with a direct product. Any group that I get in that way, that's going to give me a definable class of matrix. Uh, so I have the blue definable region and the red non-definable region, but there is a gap of white separating them that that white gap is non-empty. It contains semi-direct products amongst other things. So where is the blue going to meet the red? Where is the boundary between blue and red? I am confident that we can push the blue region out. I know that we can push the blue region out a little bit further. I don't know exactly how far. I think it's probable that we'll be able to push the red region inwards a little bit more by proving some more non-definability results. But where are they going to meet? That is an open question. I don't have a guess as to the answer. I don't have a reasonable conjecture. This, I think, is a, a, a wide open question. So we have lots of work left to do. Okay, and that is where I'm going to stop. So thank you all very much for being here and listening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Dylan. Uh, are there any questions? And I should say this at the beginning, but uh, if you're muted, the easiest way to ask a question if you're on desktop is just to hold down spacebar and you can talk and we'll hear you while you're holding it down. Um, maybe I'll start with a question then. Uh, do you know any abelian groups in the white region? Um, yes. Yes. Um, 
binary string, infinite binary strings with finite support. That's in the white region, but the, well, it's not actually because I know I can prove definability for it. Um, so actually my blue region is a little bit larger than what I've drawn here. Um, abelian groups. Yeah, so I think those might be the only abelian examples I know in the white region, and I'm pretty sure I can prove definability for those. So it may be that this question is open only for non-abelian groups. Oh, um, something else I know about the white region, there's nothing simple in there. So the question is only open for, for non-simple groups. Okay, thank you. Very nice talk. Can you tell me whether you know the answer to what are the matroids that are definable in first order logic? Is that, is that, is that what it must be known, surely? Uh, yeah, I think it is going to be um, classes of matroids that have, well, it's weird because you, know, you need infinitely many sentences to define the class of matroids, right? Um, so uh, that's, that's something that feels a little bit unnatural if you're familiar with matroid axioms. You think of there being three axioms, not a, not a countable number, countably infinite number. But you know, if you stipulate that a countable infinity, a countable infinite number of axioms is no longer weird, then you can get classes. Basically, all you can define, you can exclude restrictions. So you can exclude particular matroids as restrictions. So if you have a class of matroids that is characterized by a list of um, excluded restrictions, then you can do that in first order logic. And that's exactly the answer? Um, I think so. I think that is going to be the answer. That is not written down anywhere. I'm pretty sure that is going to be true, though. Okay, thank you. I think Jim had a question. Yeah, so um, going back to this monadic second order versus second order, I think you gave a very compelling argument that monadic second order is natural. And I've always just accepted that that's that's true, um, but it still doesn't say second order is not natural. So uh, can you tell me some classes that are definable in second order that can scare me even more so I can just really believe you that monadic second order is the right answer? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Monadic second order is a, a good answer, but why is second order not a good answer? Good thing. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I. I need to think about how to do this, but because second order logic is so powerful, full second order logic allows you to quantify over families of sets, amongst other things. It allows you to quantify over functions and relations. That gives you a huge amount of power. I'm pretty sure in second order logic, you could talk about fields, you could talk about field extensions, you could define the class of algebraic matroids. So that's a pretty scary class. Um, the class of algebraic matroids is pretty wild. Um, I, I haven't thought exa about exactly how you do that, but I think probably you could. I, don't, I mean, is algebraic matroid scary enough for you? What, if you want to propose a scary class, maybe we could think about how to do it in second order logic. Well, if you could just say every minor closed class was definable in... That's 100% true. I, wait, is it? Hmm. I need to think about that. That that might well, be true. I mean, that you, might be true. If you knew that, you wouldn't have told me about algebraic matroids, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's an interesting question. I don't have a, an answer ready to go, but um, it might be possible that every minor closed class is definable in monadic second order logic. Yeah. Yeah, I need to think more about that. I don't know the answer. You, you said monadic second order, but you meant second order. I'm sorry. I, I, it may be that every minor closed class is definable in full second order logic or a version of full second order logic. That would certainly convince me. Yeah, sure. Are there any more questions? Okay, well, thank you again, Dylan. Uh, and we'll call, it, everyone. we'll call it a day there.